Oh, no, I look at ASEAN as being um, uh, Indonesia's platform. It is by far the biggest country. It is today primed to take a leadership role. It has the largest economy. It has pretty stable democracy. It has quite strong institution. ASEAN Secretary Sarah is already there. But unfortunately, I don't get a sense that Indonesia is very committed to ASEAN. Inilah Endgame. Teman-teman, hari ini kita kedatangan Nazir Razak, teman dekat saya yang merupakan mantan pimpinan dari CIMB Group dan sekarang sibuk dengan dunia private equity dan beliau juga adalah anak dari Perdana Menteri Kedua Malaysia. Hi Jay. Hi. Thanks for coming on to our show. Pleasure. Hey, I, I, I want to start off with uh, asking a little bit about your background. Uh, you want to talk about how you grew up uh, and, and, you know, academically and how you got into the profession of banking and, and how you've seen the two countries of Malaysia and Indonesia, you know, growing in the past few decades. Please. That's a long, long question. It's like my life story. <laughs> the, yeah. the idea is for me to ask a simple question and you give us the long answer. <laughs> no, no, I had a, a, a rather unusual um, uh, early upbringing. I mean, I, my, I mentioned my father was the uh, uh, prime minister then. Um, right. when, when I was born, he was deputy prime minister and then he became uh, prime minister in uh, 1971. Uh, and so until uh, I was nine, um, I was sort of, you know, uh, PM son uh, for most of it. And uh, that was rather uh, unusual upbringing. I mean, you were kind of living in this humongous government mansion and you had uh, everything you you you, uh, you want uh, within seconds and stuff. Um, then when I was nine, my, my, my father uh, passed away rather suddenly uh, at right. the age of 53. Um, and um, um, that kind of... Uh, took me uh, by, uh, by shock, uh, leaving my mother and five relatively young sons uh, to look after. Um, um, then about a few years later, when I was 13, I was sent off to boarding school. That was the kind of SOP uh, of the family because my, my father felt that if we stayed in Malaysia, we would be spoiled as PM son. And so I had this, uh, um, sudden shock of arriving in uh, uh, yeah, the north of England uh, at right. the age of 13 um, and not knowing a great deal. Uh, and at that time, the school also had very few foreigners. Uh, so I was really uh, the kind of outsider or the, the I defined diversity at this uh, uh, very old uh, British institution. I uh, spent five years there um, and then um, I went to university. Uh, I did my um, undergraduate at Bristol. Um, economics and politics. Then I went to do a postgraduate at Cambridge, uh, also in uh, economics and politics, but focusing on uh, developing countries. Uh, then at that time, um, you know, Cambridge was a very left-wing uh, uh, place. You know, uh, we believed that uh, uh, everything state was good. Uh, you know, everything uh, to do with just redistribution was good, and so on and so forth. So I kind of thought I'd go back and and uh, join government uh, and serve the people. Wow. Uh, but then I arrived home and my brothers told me, you know, government service isn't what it used to be. Uh, and this was the early 80s. Uh, sorry, sorry, this was the late 80s. And uh, Mahade had uh, essentially um, kind of pushed aside the civil service to some extent. And it was the era of the private sector. Uh, so, you know, don't go into government, but go into private sector where everybody's going. And, 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 and so I looked around, I, I said, okay, look, join, uh, I'll join banking uh, for a couple of years. The idea was going to banking and uh, learn a bit about finance and the corporate sector and then uh, go into business. Uh, so the plan was to join banking for two to three years. I stayed for 29. Wow. Um, it, became my, <laughs> it became my calling. I, I guess I was quite good at it uh, and I loved it. And I guess I joined uh, uh, a company which 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 suited me, yeah? so I guess the rest is history. The rest is the, the kind of history of CIMB. Talk talk about how you expanded uh, 
CIMB yeah. to what it is today. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's tough to find anybody who thinks that you had no part in the large expansion of the footprint of CIMB, particularly in the context of ASEAN over you know, the last 29 years? Yeah, so the, uh, when I joined CIMB, we were a small shop. I was employee oh. number 69. Wow. Uh, and we were a kind of mid-sized merchant bank, they used to call it in Malaysia. Uh, and I actually applied to the, the, the kind of big boys, the top dogs, uh, and got offers, but I decided to join, join the small shop because I, I enjoyed the idea of being a bit of an outsider. Um, I enjoyed the idea of, you know, being the challenger uh, business. Right. Um, reminded me of, you know, the way things were at school. I was always the outsider uh, fighting the system. Uh, reminded me of being my childhood, being the youngest and fighting the system that made me laugh uh, and stuff like that. So, um, and I joined CIMB. Um, uh, I joined in corporate finance, as you know, those days. Uh, corporate finance was the, uh, the hip right. department joining with all about merchant acquisitions and so on. So uh, I joined that for three years, um, and those first three years was defining because mm. I was kind of I had a you know I, I, to some extent you say spoiled upbringing or privileged upbringing, and uh, I remember um, uh, firstly it was you know a real pleasure uh, treasure to get a job. Mm. Um, at that time, there weren't so many jobs around, and uh, uh, we worked very, very hard. Uh, and I remember my first piece of work was a kind of two inch book, which was a submission to the regulatory authority so that it could take the company public. And it was such a bad piece of work that my boss picked it up and smacked it on my head. Uh, seriously? And, yeah, yeah, seriously. No kidding. Yeah, no kidding. You'd get arrested for that these days. But wow. those days, you know, I was like, I'd do anything to keep my job. So I just kept quiet and just, you know, did all the amendments he wanted and made sure the next, and I would forever do better work. Um, and, you know, he was such a workaholic that you could only, you know, he spent all his time with clients. And so you could only meet him at 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. at oh, night. So okay. I had to work those hours every day, at least. You know, so it, it was grueling. Um, but, you know, we were the challengers. And somehow or other, we were a small merchant bank that did extremely well in IPOs. Uh, and we won the IPO of Naga Nacional, which was the National right. Electric Utility. And all the IPO uh, in 1992, uh, and that kind of changed the whole um, uh, profile of CIMB. Uh, it became the first global uh, IPO from uh, Malaysia. Uh, so you know, I was uh, the first one to go on an IPO roadshow. <laughs> and stuff like that. It was it was a really thrilling. But how big, how big was the IPO at that time? It was uh, 3.2 billion ringgit. Wow, that's huge. It was big at that and time. Yeah. So the domestic market couldn't mm. could absorb, so we had to do an international growth show. Uh, and because it was such a hot deal that all the global banks wanted a piece of the action, so right. they, it became nice to me because I was running the deal. Uh, so I managed to look at you know, how global investment banks were structured. I went to New York, Hong Kong, and several looked at their offices, etc. And then I decided, look, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I understand this and I want to be an investment banker. Uh, so two things happened. One is, uh, you know, at the end of the deal, everything was, was over and there was a bit of anticlimax and so on and so forth. So uh, I was I was made a couple of very attractive offers. Uh, you yeah. will know this better than most, but, you know, it was like I was being, it was like a professional footballer, right? right. It was sign on bonus uh, to Merrill Lynch sure. or Lima Brothers then, to be based in Hong Kong. And uh, I was going to go. But then I thought about it, I said, why don't instead, I'm so vested in CIMB, why don't I try and transform CIMB into an investment bank? Uh, so I stayed, I went into the broking side of the business, I, I helped transform the broking side, I integrated it with the merchant bank, and we became this thing called an investment bank. Uh, and by 1999, which was 10 years after I joined, in the age of 32, I became CEO uh, of uh, CIMB. Wow. Uh, and um, then those days, in 1999, you remember, was the Asian financial crisis. Sure. And what CIMB did was, you know, whereas most companies made a lot of money in uh, stock booking and equities in the early 1990s, uh, they reinvested more into the equities business. We took the profits and invested it into a new business called fixed income. So during the Asian financial crisis, we were actually the only bank that was prepared to intermediate the ringgit bond markets. 
Uh, so when the government needed to raise bonds or corporates needed to uh, exchange uh, loans into uh, fixed income, uh, there was only CIMB that was uh, kind of structured um, or able to do it. Uh, so CIMB went into the crisis as a sort of top four uh, investment bank, came out of the crisis as number one by a long shot. Um, and uh, so we did that what, very what, well. what differentiated was was with the fixed income business the only thing that differentiated you from the other banks at that time? Uh, more or less. I mean, we were already quite good at IPOs. Okay. Um, there weren't many IPOs uh, actively, but it, fixed income was the thing. I mean, the, the ring of bond markets yeah. was, uh, grew exponentially. Uh, okay. And bonds, of course, is not just um, um, uh, uh, IPOs, right? Bonds were also about trading. So we became good at it because we use our balance sheet and we were making markets and bonds and we made tons of money. Wow. So then, um, you know, after the crisis, we were company number one and decided that, you know, to, to kind of take it further, I really needed to IPO the bank. Uh, and this was in uh, early 2002 uh, when we decided to uh, uh, take CIMB public. Uh, it was quite a, um, a radical decision because our parent company was already listed. So, uh, people say, well, why do you want to list a subsidiary? But, you know, I wanted to, to differentiate the brand for CIM. Uh, and of course, as part of the IPO, um, I also asked that I be um, awarded some options on the stock. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they said, fine. So I got some options, five options on 5% of the company at uh, uh, IPO price, and I took it public. Okay. Uh, it wasn't a great IPO to start with. Um, and well, then, it's, it's a long view that matters, right? Well, it was interesting because it was probably the only IPO where I didn't have a party afterwards. I see. Because, you know, we listed and normally you expect an IPO to go at least 10, 15 or more percent up. I was, was flat. Uh, so this guy who thought he was the king of IPOs actually screwed up his own IPO. Um, so that's one good lesson in life. As I said, look, we're not going to put our head in the stand. We're just going to sit in this room and we're going to decide why uh, we screwed up this IPO. So we brainstormed it and realized that we kind of made a bit of a hash of, um, um, you know, the, 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 the sales story and our capital and so on and so forth. So uh, we did something rather dramatic, which was within four months of IPO, we paid a huge dividend, which wow. is kind of stupid thing to do. Right? Okay. You, know, you bought the, 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 the shares for one ringgit 75 cents and in four months, you got a 40 cents dividend. That was fine. Uh -huh. so, but the world, so investors wanted to know who these crazies were. And I had another chance to go back to the market. And the rest is history because in three years, our stock went up 343%. See, the long view matters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you you so, could have also done a share buyback. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you could have done a share buyback. But I wanted to really shock the market. Uh, and uh, uh, so, um, you know, so then, then actually it was interesting because then financial um, concerns kind of disappeared for me. You know, I was always a bit worried whether um, I had enough money for 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 my lifestyle, um, but that ended with the IPO of CIMB and so on. So money was set aside. It was always more about um, evolving CIMB, progressing CIMB to to you know what it's uh, what it was truly capable of. And uh, after that, in the mid two thousands, uh, I decided that it wasn't good enough to be an investment bank. I decided that um, you know there are a lot of things happening, but overall the Universal banks were winning, whereas yeah. you know this the, the big banks, the HSBC and the sure. maybe more, more writing corporate banking checks and winning IB mandates. So I said, if we really want to be an IB, we have to be a UB. We have to therefore convert CIMB into a universal bank. So then we decided to buy uh, banks. So we bought uh, our sister bank, which was called Winnie Thomas then in 2005. Uh, and then we bought um, um, Southern Bank, which was a, a competing bank uh, in 2006. Uh, so with those two acquisitions, CIMB became, went from the investment bank into Malaysia's, you know, top three uh, uh, universal bank. Hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, it was at the same time that um, um, ASEAN was coming to, to be. I, I don't know if you recall, at the beginning of uh, 2007, there was an ASEAN summit where they decided to accelerate and the AEC. Right. Said, uh, 2012 will sure. be a. Uh, I, was, I was part of that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So by 2007, um, there was this 
notion of an ASEAN economic community by 2015. Uh, and we had already uh, invested, uh, when, when we bought Muntra Commerce, they already had a stake in this bank called Bank Niaga in Indonesia. Right. So when we took it over, we said, look, you know, why do we remain in just Malaysia, right? We could replicate this model across ASEAN. And guess what? ASEAN is going to be a, a, a economic community in 2015, right? Where the single production-based free movement of uh, skilled labor and investments and capital and so on and so forth. So it was all very exciting. So we said, okay, so we're going to build uh, a, a truly ASEAN bank. Uh, so we went on this um, uh, acquisition spree after buying two banks in Malaysia. We bought one, another one uh, in Indonesia, which right. was Lippo Bank. You remember Correct. you acted first. Correct. In, uh, yep. Yeah, Lippo. Yep. We bought Bank Thai in Thailand, uh, and then in uh, in Singapore we couldn't get a, a banking license. Uh, we already had a banking license with two branches, uh, so we decided to go internet banking only uh, or phone banking at that time. And then, uh, digital as well uh, and then we bought uh, I got a new license in Cambodia and, and and so on so by you know the target of being in every country uh, yeah. was completed by uh, uh, just before I left in 2018 but the, the 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 interesting part is of course ASEAN didn't quite live up to its promise uh, by 2015 it wasn't quite uh, what it uh, uh, promised to be that's one um, and therefore, what that meant was that the synergies uh, from having cross-border banking wasn't quite what we thought it would be. Uh, like in Indonesia, we couldn't move people, we couldn't outsource uh, IT and so on and so on. So a lot of the, the value of uh, um, uh, synergies wasn't quite there. Um, and um, the other thing that transpired was the global financial crisis, which led to the re-regulation of banks. Yeah. So And then it became... Um, you know, uh, uh, too demanding in terms of capital. Uh, so there were some strains on our balance sheet because of uh, all these uh, factors uh, at the time. Uh, but, you know, I, I would never uh, uh, even think of doing it otherwise. It was a tremendous experience. Yeah, uh, building Probably an experience. You know, we, 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 you know, we, we are, we, we became uh, the fifth largest bank uh, in terms of assets, but you know, to me, it was about the people. It was about meeting people. It was about uh, running the experience of building a franchise in Indonesia. I mean, Indonesia was, you know, I, I saw it all. You know. When we wanted to buy, first wanted to buy Bank Niaga, uh, and I was the, at that time, an investment banker acting for, for commerce. Uh, it was 1999, coming out of the Asian financial crisis. Right. Uh, we went to uh, Ibra. Ibra. Uh, and I met uh, the um, president commissioner then, uh, or, or chairman then, which was uh, Glenn Yusuf. Correct. Uh, our mutual took, friend. Our mutual friend. And it took, uh, it's only five press comms later uh, that we finally got approval to buy Bang <laughs> um, You know, it was going through this tremendous period of uh, 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 change and uh, yeah. uncertainty. You know, that it was very interesting. It was at a time. When we first were trying to buy Bang Nyaga, I remember meeting someone who said, look, you know, I can help you buy the bank. So I said, really? So I went to see him and he said, yeah. You know, and he was having this conversation and he goes, Indonesia's problem, it is very, very corrupt. But, you know, and all these people who are corrupt should go to jail. But by the way, if you want to buy Bang Nyaga, I can help me if you pay me a bit of money. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he gave me this spiel without pausing. I was quite astonished. <laughs> but I, you know, I learned my lesson that you know, in the end of the day, one thing you must never do, especially in uh, uh, in, in, in regionalizing business, is, is, is play that game because you know the foreigner is always the one who gets caught. Right? So we never touched any of that stuff. Uh, right. But we were still successful. In oh, you pulled through. You pulled it off. Through. But, you know, it was scary because when we, I remember Ibra telling me, you better make a good bid because it's a very competitive situation. So I said, okay. So we made a very good bid in terms of valuation and all that. I mean, we, we paid one and a half times book, which of right. course now sounds cheap. But at the time, you know, uh, it was aggressive. Yep. Uh, and oh, I remember yeah. Ibra calling me up and said, you've been shortlisted. You are successful. So I was so happy. And I said, 
you know, oh, who's on the short list? He said, uh, nobody else, it's just you. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you it's, mean it's we a very short list. list. <laughs> yeah, very short list. So then I got, I, I, I got scared. I said, what do everybody, what does everyone know that I don't? And of course, when we announced it, our stock got hammered 25%. Ouch. Because international investors were saying, you know, Indonesia is this country, this failed state. It will yeah. never be. Uh, and so it was quite scary at that time. But of course, we were proven absolutely right. Because, you know, yeah. say, no, the, the long view matters. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. And, you know, I really enjoyed every moment of getting to know Indonesia. I remember, yeah. you know, one thing I, I the mistake we always made was that this whole concept of serumpun. <laughs> means, you know, we're all... Uh, one ethnic group and so on, we love each other and so on, but you know, uh, it's a very different place to do business. Uh, and uh, I remember, you know, CIMB has this internet banking where you use uh, a mascot, which was the right. uh, And I gave the instruction, every, all, since we are regional bank, every part of CIMB must use the octopus as the, um, as the mascot for internet banking. Uh, and then I ensured that thousands of octopuses went to uh, uh, Indonesia. And then whilst they were distributing, finally someone had the, the, the guts to tell me, he said, sir, uh, you do know that octopus is what the press uses to describe corrupt politicians, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I had to no harm intended. Octopuses back. So that was a good lesson that how, you know, in terms of being regional, uh, you mustn't harmonize completely. You must understand the local. Yeah, yeah. Know? It's so easy to get misinterpreted. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey, look, you've, you've, you've done okay, man. You started out, you know, when this thing was just a startup, right? And over, what, 29 years, this has become a behemoth. But I, I want to ask you, uh, before we switch to another topic, uh, how you see CIMB further metamorphosizing uh, by way of the digitization that we're seeing happening so rapidly? You know, it, it could be very soon that, you know, we could all bank just with a hand phone, uh, globally speaking, not just regionally. Now, how do you see the banking industry transforming? Not just CIMB per se, but I think the whole banking industry. Who, will, will you see more that will not survive as opposed to more that will survive? I think what's going to happen is that you're going to have two types of banks. Uh, one with uh, reasonable ROEs and the other one with dismal ROEs. Uh, and essentially the ones that will have decent ROEs are the ones that are able to leverage on the customer base and the branding they have now to transform themselves uh, with the customer. Right? The other type of bank uh, will not be able to do that, will not be able to you know, go beyond uh, lending. And so therefore they'll just be providers of balance sheet uh, earning very, old, very low ROEs. Uh, and this is CIMB's challenge. CIMB has a good brand. He has a, you know, whatever it is, 15 million customers across ASEAN. It has to transform into a digital bank. And it's very, very difficult to do it within the bank itself. I mean, I, I, I tried it and it was tough. Because, you know, your um, legacy bankers, your retail bankers sure. will, um, you know, will uh, kind of put barriers and they sure. don't do it any mal intent. It's just the sure. way they are and doing things. Yeah. Uh, and then you have these young guys trying to start a digital bank to do things differently and they get blocked all the way. Uh, and so, you know, I always think that for banks to, to really be successful with this transformation, they really have to do it offline to yeah. create digital bank offline uh, and, you know, create the entrepreneurial spirit uh, and then kind of reverse it back into the main organization. I agree. I agree. All right. Uh, enough of banking. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't know that you're actually the descendant of Sultan Hasanuddin, right? Who was born in the 17th century. Talk, talk a little bit about that historical perspective of yours. Yes. Uh, Bugis heritage um, yeah. in 1722. I think yeah. it was the grand uh, channel of Sultan Hasanuddin. Yeah. Uh, and the Bugis Asibari. Sultan Hasanuddin was born in 1631, I believe. So the grandson of Sultan Hasanuddin. Yeah. Okay. And the grandson or granddaughter, we're not sure, but jumped on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and then... So we had a boat in the 18th century. 
We had a lot of those, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and roamed the east coast of Malaysia and landed in um, Pahang on the wow. east coast in a village and settled in a village that would eventually be called Kampung Makassar. It still exists today. Yeah, so there's a Kampung Makassar where, where uh, they settled and this family uh, integrated into the local community and actually became uh, sort of uh, what they call orang kayas or chieftains around the um, around well, the, and this part of the world means rich man. Yeah, well, in Malaysia, <laughs> it's sort of people, um, and uh, they didn't have much money, but they were chiefs. Uh, there were four main orang kayas around the southern okay. of Pahang those days, uh, and it was semi hereditary. So unless you were badly behaved, you would get it. You were the eldest son. Um, so over the uh, next two, three centuries, um, my family uh, were the Orangkayas. Uh, and this meant we were kind of, you know, sort of the administrators and so on of, of, of the Malay community in Baham. Okay. And that meant that by, um, you know, the late uh, 19th century during the British uh, uh, administration, my father, my grandfather, and so on, were actually educated in, uh, you know, in Malay College, which is kind of uh, the boarding school based on the British model that trained future administrators. Okay. Uh, my, fa my father also did the same thing, and that kind of put them in, in good place to rise up the administrative, the administrative structure, um, which eventually then uh, was a platform for him to go into politics. And uh, you know, we, 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 we do connect back to our um, uh, lineage. I, I went to Goa uh, no to uh, visit uh, the uh, makam of Kanatulin. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, when, you know, they heard I was arriving through the Siam Niaga branch, um, <laughs> my long lost cousins, which is the crown prince, uh, invited me over to the palace. Wow. Uh, I was thrilled. So I went there. And pre presumably he was a CIMB customer. He was a CIMB customer. Okay. <laughs> so he showed me around the palace and he showed me this map. And he said, our territory was this. And he showed me a map that was that uh, stretched from northern Philippines all oh, yeah. the way down to northern Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, this was the size of our empire. And today we're just this house. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> it was, well, it was times change, fun. man. Yeah. <laughs> times yeah, change. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then he said, um, "I need to introduce you to my daughter." At which point, I got very worried. Um, but then, so his daughter comes up, and is a very pretty lady. And I was like, "I hope this is not what I really think it is." <laughs> he goes, "This is my daughter. I want you to meet her. She's standing for elections. Could you ask the Niaga staff to vote?" <laughs> 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 so that was that was a catch over lunch. <laughs> you can see how modernity. Oh, <laughs> oh my! The royal enclave. Uh, and so, you immediately yeah. sent an email to all your staff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite. <laughs> Go out there and vote. <laughs> oh man. And 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 okay, let's talk about your dad's friendship with uh, our dear legendary friend Des Awi. Talk mm. about that. I, I think that's that's an that's a very very interesting well, you know, historical part that yeah, so I think dad, a lot of people uh, here ought to know. After the war, um, he then you know his his studies was was interrupted by the war when he then you know he he he, he first worked he first worked for the Japanese and then he was part of the uh, resistance force and so on. But his studies were were interrupted and then after the war he applied for a scholarship and he went to London. In London, he was uh, politically quite active uh, in the Malaysian uh, uh, student society there, or Malay student society. Uh, he was in the same batch as Lee Kuan Yew and uh, um, and others. Uh, and in Malaysian case, he was Tupac Brahman, who was our first prime minister, was his good buddy. Right. Uh, and it turns out that his best friend at that time was Indonesian. He hung around with the Indonesian group, uh, and his best friend was Des Albi. And through Des, um, I understand that they organized a lot of events for the uh, initially uh, in, in kind of sympathy with uh, the Indonesian um, independence movement. And I know he met with, is it Sultan Sharir? Sultan Sharir, yeah. yeah he met, he definitely Another met legend, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and I know he traveled to Brussels with Des Aloui, and in fact, they went on a uh, European road trip uh, together, and they formed a very strong friendship, uh, which continued. And interestingly, it then became a very important um, means for which uh, he negotiated peace uh, with Indonesia during the confrontation mm -hmm. in uh, 1960. Uh, there was even a famous um, incident where Des Alwi organized for um, the, the, the teams from Indonesia and Malaysia, Malaya, or Malaysia then right. uh, to, in Bangkok. And for the meeting, I understand the Indonesian delegation had to wear Garuda uniforms to uh, disguise <laughs> uh, themselves for the week. Uh, and of course, you know, Des then, I think, ne negotiated with um, uh, Suharto as um, he, uh, there was a regime change in the right. East. Uh, and then together with um, uh, Adam Malik, yep. um, on the sign. The Not a legend, yeah. Treaty. And of course, uh, those two also came together again um, in the Bangkok Declaration in 67, mm. uh, formation of ASEAN. Wow. The five countries, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Des Alwi has a, has a famous uh, place to visit in the Bandas, you know, which, which has been visited by many royalties around the world and visitors from all over the world. So he's, he's done wonders for the country. Yeah. So, uh, okay, let's, let's jump into uh, your country, man. You want to talk about your country? <laughs> what's going on, man? As, as a layman like me, what, what's the best way to better understand what's going on in Malaysia right now and what to expect uh, off Malaysia going forward? Well, Malaysia is going through a um, transition period, I suppose, uh, you could call it, from... Uh, 63 years of leadership or government by one party. Right. Um, then you had a change in, in, in ruling party uh, and that new ruling party, which was called Pakatan Harapan, fell after 20 months. Uh, and now you have another coalition called Rikatan National, which includes the old Barisan uh, um, in there. Uh, and they are now uh, ruling, but you know, it's a bit more complex than that. Um, and you know, I have a like slightly you know unique perspective uh, of all this. You know, I believe that uh, um, developing countries we don't know, or we never knew, or our founding fathers never knew what was right for the society, for um, the times, and so on and so forth. So we just took on a system at independence, and in Malaysia's case. Because we were a British colony, we took on the Westminster system. There was no other reason. Right. And that Westminster system um, didn't work. You know, at the first hurdle, which was the May 1969 um, elections, uh, it uh, fell. You know, uh, there was an outbreak of race riots uh, then, uh, and the, we had an emergency rule. Uh, I say it fell its first hurdle because the earlier elections you kind of caught up in this euphoria of uh, uh, nationalism, this uh, um, independence, and then it was confrontasi with Indonesia and so on. So, 69, it, 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 it broke down and we had emergency rule uh, for 20 odd months. And that's when uh, my father uh, ascended to the PM ship. Uh, my father was, uh, became more or less a dictator. Uh, after the May 30th riot, right? they, they named him Director of the National Operations Council, uh, which by which he ruled by decree. Mm. Uh, and during that time, you know, uh, he felt that he, he needed checks and balances. So he set up what he called the National Consultative Committee right. uh, Council. And, and that council, or NCC as I call it, um, that council essentially also um, was engaged in order to um, institute reforms, right, that were necessary uh, to the system. Yeah. Right. So basically, democracy in the Westminster uh, way um, uh, had to be tweaked uh, for our plural society and so on. So they came up with a, a few innovations, including um, the 
national principles or Rukun Nagara, which I think mm. is based on the Pancasila to some extent. Mm. Interesting. Uh, then they came up with uh, the new economic policy, which is affirmative action in favor of the Bhumiputra of Bhumi. Mm. And, and they also um, came up with some submission laws where you could not question certain things like um, 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 the, the, the role of the monarchy and the religion and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, and they also came up with this, you know, Barisan National, which is essentially a grand coalition of parties and right. they're uh, minimizing uh, political tension uh, at a time when politics was purely about identity. It was all about identity and you know every then the, the, the 69 elections it was the 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 narrative you know every campaign was about uh, my my race versus your race you know? yeah it's coming back nowadays yeah unfortunately uh, <laughs> sure, yeah, but, yeah but you know malaysia decided to tweak the system but that system which includes affirmative action in favor of uh malays uh to to, to greater extent than had been previously. Uh, I just wanted to qualify that the British introduced affirmative action in the first instance in 1912. So it wasn't I see. then. Okay. Uh, but it, what the NEP did was it kind of sanctioned that we would use the state to accelerate uh, redistribution of, of wealth between the races. What is often forgotten is the, the designers of the NEP felt that you needed to redistribute wealth in order to have the foundations for national unity. Mm. It sounds a bit uh, uh, contradictory, but it was felt that you couldn't unify the nation at a time when the Malays that constitute sort of, you know, over 50% of the population had 2% of corporate wealth, right? Mm. The vast majority had only a small amount of the corporate wealth uh, yeah. and they controlled the administration. So it was, there's so much imbalance which was inherited from the British. So they came up with this system and they said, look, you know, we, it's not fair. So this system can only last for 20 years. So the new economic policy was set for 20 years and then mm. should be visited. Unfortunately, this system creates a lot of vested interest. Sure. Uh, and a lot of uh, government intervention into the economy and so on and so forth. And and it, you know, it, it kind of burst a lot of um, um, kind of negative behavior, uh, if you like to put it mildly, yeah. uh, such that it was very difficult uh, to remove the system. Uh, and the, once you're in power, you kind of enjoy it because you're, you basically control everything, you control government companies, you control uh, distribution of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, this new economic policy remains in place after 50 years, right? My father and his gang thought it should only be around for 20 years. It's still here after 50 years and it's morphed, it's been abused, uh, and um, uh, it needs to be rebound. And it is also the reason why politics in Malaysia has become some of dysfunction. I see. Uh, and uh, it's also the reason why um, the institutions have become weak. Um, so uh, if I reflect back, maybe, maybe one could argue that um, the problem was when the Asian financial crisis came, unlike Indonesia, we insulated ourselves. So there was not political change. So, we had reform in the corporate sector, yeah. um, but there was not reform in, um, the, in politics. Uh, and because the political system continued, actually the reforms in the in the corporate sector also faded away. You know, in terms of governance and uh, um, um, behavior of government companies and so on, that kind of faded after a few years. Um, whereas, if I reflect on Indonesia, yes, you went through a torrid time in the early two thousand, mm. uh, but today you're one of the most stable democracies in the world, yeah. and. I look at the independence of your institution. Yeah, it's not perfect, um, but yeah. you know uh, it does a pretty good job uh, in you know uh, diminishing corruption and so on and so forth. So, you know that's 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 where I think you know we are still missing. The system doesn't work, and we can't figure out a way of um, uh, reforming it uh, holistically. So I spent a year in Oxford um, in 2019 to study. Um, what I call nature recalibration, how 
nations need, I think, developing nations often need to go through this renewal process over mm. time. The system, right. you know, is, 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 has too much, too many weaknesses. And, you know, but unfortunately, many, uh, in most situations, you do need a breakdown before you actually turn to holistic reform. Uh, you saw that in apartheid, you saw that in the Asian financial crisis in Indonesia, um, and so on. And, and, and Malaysians uh, are generally not hungry enough <laughs> to go yeah. through uh, such, uh, such uh, situations or so, uh, to demand uh, so much change. So um, I, I, I am now uh, you know, kind of trying to advocate uh, this uh, national recalibration from Malaysia. I have one public to say that we need another, a second National Consultative Council, like we did in 1970. Uh, would, would you do it exactly the same way you did it in the 70s, or would you, okay? How, how would you do it differently this time? So what you need is what NCC was is a deliberative platform. Yeah. And if you look at the literature on deliberative platforms today, I mean this is a popular notion in the West. You saw it in the creation of a national assembly in in Ireland uh, to deal with the issue of abortion. You've seen it in, you know, in, 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 in Belgium, uh, for instance, when the federal government was dysfunctional, you know, uh, they created these deliberative platforms, which typically involve intellectuals and also general um, a representation from the public and the debate uh, without um, 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 being deferring to political parties or political allegiances. And if you, if you take that thought further, it is very difficult for parliament of elected representatives to deal with long-term structural issues. People don't vote for what they yeah, voted, but I agree. Vote, people vote for what the party whip tells them to do. Yeah. So I can deal with issues that are you know around the corner, you know, are, yeah. are kind of current, yeah, and um, you know, position me for the next election. But I can't deal with long-term structural issues where we talk about the social contract. Uh, we talk about the role of religion, we talk about the constitution. These mm. cannot be dealt with by parliament. So my argument is that, you know, like then, we just need this platform of the good and the great in Malaysia to debate uh, the best way forward. Of course, you know, conditions are different. Maybe in 1970, the dictator, my father then, could just, you know, uh, decide or could just decree the setup of this committee and who, who was on the committee. Today, we may need um, the Rulers' Council, uh, for instance, to do it instead of the executive. I don't know. But these are some of the things to consider. Um, but net-net, you need a very credible um, um, platform. Representation, to, yeah. yeah. What, what, are, what are the risks of this thing getting deplatformed? Or the oh. risks that this thing has no accountability or has no grip with decision makers in the country? Well, you know, you, it could go wrong. You could have yeah. a different platform and then it presents uh, uh, a set of proposals to parliament, which is then rejected. And <laughs> it, that could happen. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, that's why the credibility of this platform is important. I see. And the ability of this platform to cut the deal. You know, one of the problems we always have is that every time the government wants to do something, it actually affects one community. The government wanted to, you know, uh, in, uh, legitimize the UEC or the examination certificates for from Chinese schools. Of course, when it wanted to do that, the Pakatan Harapan government, the Malays were screaming because to the Malays, this is disadvantaged media. So the Malays blocked it, it couldn't be done. So, so you cannot do cut these deals in isolation. You need to put everything on the table and say, okay, this is for this community, this is for this community, and then let's see. Everybody happy, everybody gets something. Uh, so you need to cut the deal right across to reconstitute the, 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 whole, the whole new deal uh, for Malaysia. You know? you, you've, you've talked about identity politics, right? And then you've also separately talked about money politics and the concentration of power. How, how do you see these issues getting more attenuated or, or even disappearing, uh, you know? In, in your future uh, in Malaysia? I mean, it, it seems to be prevalent, right? And, and not just in Malaysia, in just about every other country. Uh, that, that seems to be the common theme. Yeah. How, how do you deal with it from a Malaysian perspective? Yeah, so I've, I've written about what I call the three-headed monster. Right. Um, so this three-headed monster basically munches up every 
piece of decent reform that comes. Either you, you know, because you know, because of uh, uh, monetary incentives or because I would uh, oppose it uh, using race and religion um, and and or you know uh, things are not properly done because um, there is too much concentration of power in the PM's office uh, and therefore things are not properly thought through. These are the kind of typical. Um, I can probably uh, attribute every bad decision to one of those three. Right? Um, um, uh, and you know the way I look at it is with the understanding that these are the the the, the, the key traits of this monster uh, in a national consultative council setting. We need to deal with them. So if you look at them one by one, if you look at the power of the prime minister, um, how you know for the longest time until recently, until uh, 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 2018. The Prime Minister was also the Finance Minister, his corporate setting, his CEO, is CFO, right? <laughs> <laughs> Every decision goes through the Prime Minister. So, you know, when, when, when Mahade in the, uh, in the 90s, you know, when he did the privatization program, he had the best of intentions, but unfortunately the system was so concentrated that, you know, it wasn't about, you know, who's got the value, best value proposition. It's really about, who manages to you know get Mahadev not? So how you know how good can that decision making possible? Um, and so you need a situation where you know power concentration the PM's office is reduced. Uh, relatedly, you may also want to devolve more power to the state governments. Uh, and there's also this big issue about what we call here in Malaysia MA63, which was the agreement we signed in 1963 with Sabah and Strau. Right, Sabah and Strawakin will always remind you that actually it was, it was a three uh, tripartite deal: Sabah, Strawak, and Peninsular Malaya. Right, uh, and since then, Sabah and Strawak believe that they've been relegated to just another state in Malaysia. Um, so this kind of uh, 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 issues have to be uh, looked at in as part of uh, kind of reducing the power of the PMs of. Then identity politics, you know, how do you um, evolve uh, such that you're not, um, every issue is not translated in a racial or religious terms. And here you're not going to deal with it overnight. you got to think of an evolution process such that you get to a time when, you know, yes, I still know I'm Malay, um, but when it comes to national issues, I'm Malaysian. Um, that's the evolution in academic terms from a plural society to a pluralistic society. Right? Right. Where you put national interest first and you can discuss issues uh, more maturely. And of course, the third element is money politics, which you know, you know as well as I do, every country has a problem. Um, but there are many, many ways of accepting that democracy needs to be mobilized by uh, financial resources. But right. you, know, you kind of put in rules and regulations such that you know, um, uh, there are limits to everything. And, you know, one of the problems you have in Malaysia here is that the anti-corruption agency, which, uh, which, 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 uh, and the electoral commission, those are the two central bodies that manage um, uh, political competition are all still reporting to the prime minister, right? It's like, you know, playing football and the referee reports to one team. <laughs> <laughs> We need to rebuild the independence of, of those institutions. And you saw the way you know, in Indonesia, you know, those yeah. institutions actually, in many respects, have become more and more independent from the president. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me push on this uh, identity politics issue. Uh, I've, I've been hypothesizing in the past that, you know, to a lot of extent, identity politics is correlated with inequality, right? And, and the more unequal the society becomes, the more or the higher the tendency for anyone to gravitate to his or her, you know, racial, religious, ethnic identity, right? Uh, because of probably the lack of redistribution of welfare. Uh, and the inequality of opportunities. Uh, I, I, I think there is, there's, I think it holds water in that, you know, uh, things like that correlate with identity politics. And it's not just uniquely in Malaysia or uniquely in Indonesia, it's happening in many developed economies. 
don't you think? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think in the end there, we just have to look at the, the, the US, right? what's driving uh, populism, what's driving the kind of white supremacy is really uh, inequality. And, and I think we do need uh, to look at uh, the big picture. We do right. need to look at uh, capitalism, right? And, you know, our kind of 90s uh, version, 80s, 90s version of capitalism and what it, what, where it fell short. I mean, certainly there were, you know, even if you look at uh, uh, the Western societies, uh, it really was uh, a case where, you know, the rich got richer and this is kind of compounded with technology today, right? Or, or the digital era today is getting worse. So um, we need to look at how we reduce inequality. We need to look and, and what drives this is, and unfortunately, uh, 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 is the very boring topic of taxation. I think that's such an important tool of redistribution. I agree. You know, and in Malaysia, we don't even have capital gains tax. Yeah. You know, and we don't have windfall taxes yeah. uh, 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 properly instituted. And uh, uh, there are also many innovative ways, like you know, in Thailand, they actually tax you for. For land that you don't uh, uh, gainfully use, right. for instance, there are many ways, and there should be taxes on um, um, you know uh, increasing value of urban uh, property, for instance, versus rural. Right? Uh, that's how you create redistribution. So I'm in favor of a, a real uh, aggressive overhaul of the tax frameworks in, in in countries to create a more just society uh, across the world. Really. Okay. Hey, uh, let's let's move on to a different topic. You you set up this startup called Ikhlas, <laughs> <laughs> which which I I happen to be part of too. So I, I got to be very careful here in asking and and trying to sound as independently as possible, right? Or as objectively as possible. What's what's your thinking along Ikhlas and and what's you know what 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 is your idea, you know, about Ikhlas? No, I think it's 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 an extension uh, of what my work at CIMB in um, building uh, or supporting ASEAN integration. I think if you look at banking re-regulation today, banks have become more constrained, uh, uh, more conservative, uh, and I think there's a vacuum, um, and um, private equity can can fill that role. When I started. Um, in this business, we were called merchant banks. And right. part of merchant banking was also uh, giving loans, but also taking equity stakes in companies to help them. And I think the platform that can do that today is the private equity platform. And uh, our private equity platform uh, is quite unique in some ways. You know, we don't take control of companies. Um, we support entrepreneurs. Uh, and we build value together with them. And the typical um, opportunity for us is a, I don't know, a Malaysian company who wants to do more business in Indonesia, where we come in, we take a stake, we help them expand into Indonesia uh, with your network uh, in Indonesia, uh, and we all create value uh, together. And that's a, a, an atypical uh, A-class deal. Uh, and I was talking to some of the other private equity guys, it's quite interesting how you know, we're, we're all called private equity, but our business models are quite different. Mm -hmm. And I think we suit uh, a, a, a really interesting group uh, of entrepreneurs uh, across the region. Uh, and, you know, at this time, we're seeing a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for the kind of partnership model uh, that we offer. Now, with, with COVID, uh, having been around for around a year, uh, Talk, talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that are on the horizon from, from a PE standpoint. And, and how do you stack up with some of those other VCs that seem to have been a little bit more aggressive or proactive in looking for deals? Uh, I know there, there are different schools of thought, but you know, there, there comes a time when you know, there is a potential right, of the two intersecting at some point, and that makes it a little bit more difficult for either. Yeah, no, I mean, our history of this COVID is as follows. I think that, you know, the, 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 in the run up to COVID, we did not know COVID was coming. 
but we did feel that valuations were quite sloppy. Um, so for you know 2019, um, which was our first year, we only did one small deal, uh, which was the acquisition of a five million ringgit stake in a public company in, in Malaysia. Um, but we were evaluating a lot of deals. Uh, and um, when COVID came, uh, we continued evaluating those deals, but we said to all the entrepreneurs, um, you know, we need to take a step back and relook at, um, you know, what we were uh, contemplating in the context of you know, a prolonged uh, uh, pandemic, uh, which is actually we thought was a, a real and it is coming uh, reality now. Uh, obviously, at some point, um, this kind of divergence in view, uh, entrepreneurs always think that, you know, um, uh, their business is great and they don't suffer so much. Uh, we basically hold back. At some point, uh, the two shall meet, I think, uh, and we can close uh, these deals. Um, and uh, looking at the situation now, um, I think we're almost closing uh, three deals at the same time, um, you know, where we now have a clearer picture of you know, where COVID goes uh, on both sides. Uh, and I think that um, the value proposition of E-Class um, is such that I think, you know, the entrepreneurs are now anxious that we come on board and then ride this COVID recovery uh, together. Now, there's this different theories, right, about how long, how quickly countries are going to get adequately, if not fully vaccinated. Hmm. Uh, to, to some extent, that has bearing on valuations, right, of, of companies, right? I, I would argue that some countries are probably going to take some years before they all get vaccinated completely. Uh, some others are going to get vaccinated a lot sooner, depending on the, you know, the readiness of the cold chain infrastructure and the healthcare capabilities. Uh, so how, how do you put all that into thinking? you know, uh, for this PE exercise? Well, I think that the conservative side is that the, the kind of herd immunity levels of 70% or so will only be done uh, in, in most countries in the region by the middle of 2021. Okay. That's the um, um, conservative view uh, that we build in. But remember that, you know, it, we're not going to wait until then uh, in order to get business going again. Uh, and many businesses do actually quite well, even in COVID. Um, yep. uh, we invested in a cold chain business in the Philippines uh, recently, and that business is actually thriving uh, in the COVID environment. Um, we are looking at uh, technology company, um, and um, actually um, they are clearly benefiting uh, from COVID as well. Uh, obviously, healthcare companies have benefited. Um, so. You know, I think with the, the kind of um, line, you know, sort of you know, the end in sight type of scenario that we have now, I think it's possible uh, to converge on valuation. Uh, so I'm, I don't think it's just us. I think many private equity deals could be done in the next few months, uh, given that there's you know, some, some cert reasonable certainty uh, now. Yeah, I've talked about this a few times, so with even with some other guests, uh you know, in the context of investments, uh, you've, you've expressed to me earlier that you were quite concerned with Malaysia's recent ability to attract money, right? Investments. I'm, I'm of the view that Malaysia has been a lot more successful than some others in ASEAN, including Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. But, but to, to put it in a much broader context, right? There's so much liquidity that's floating around. Why, why is it that ASEAN or some members of ASEAN countries just can't get, you know, so much more capital. What, what, what is wrong or what can be done to remedy this situation? I think, you know, particularly for a country like Malaysia. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the ASEAN data, the, the, uh, the UNCTAD data was a little bit uh, disconcerting for us, where the average drop last year in invest FDI in ASEAN was 31%, in Malaysia's was 68%. Yeah. We found that data quite depressing. Uh, and one of the reasons I think is because, you know, countries like Malaysia, you know, is, 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 is 
um, suffering from new dynamics. Um, in the past, um, we were not competing as much with, say, Vietnam or even Indonesia to that extent. Right. Uh, and before that, not even China or India, right? If you talk about the early 1990s. Uh, and on top of that, we have the situation in Malaysia where we have political uncertainty. Now, for ASEAN as a whole, I think what is important is really make it real that we are 600 million plus market. Right. And this has been one of my frustrations, uh, as you know, for a very long time, which is that, you know, if I invest in, a, in if I'm an investor, say, in Malaysia, I, it's very difficult for me to figure out whether my market is 32 million people or 600 million people. It's very difficult because there's so much details in terms of how I export my products and so on and so forth. I actually, there are too many unknowns right. and, and things change. And, you know, the truth about ASEAN is that we all are better off with uh, an integrated economy. But some people are more better off <laughs> than others. Yeah. Uh, and it's really sad that that fact that, you know, some are better, more better off than others is actually holding us back. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and we need to get over it and, and, and really pull together. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I think that from, for Malaysia's case, we just have to step back and tweak our kind of uh, investor engagement strategies to reflect new realities. I mean, in the 90s, when I used to market Malaysia, the first line of any, sli any slide uh, deck that I had was, why invest in Malaysia? Number one is political stability, right? That first item is gone, right? At least for the moment. And we need to accept that reality and articulate the investment case in Malaysia the same way. I saw a recent ad in The Economist in Christmas where the, it was an ad for our investment agency here. And one of the first things they said, please invest in Malaysia. We're a very politically stable country, you know? so. We need to admit, we need to... to, to, to why to, why would you say otherwise, right? I mean, if you're trying to advertise the country. Yeah, but you don't <laughs> need to say it, right? <laughs> or you can say, you know, you, you don't, try, don't try and say it's uh, politically stable. Say despite the um, changes in government, government policies yeah. can remain. And, you know, we've actually never done anything to the detriment of foreign investment. Yeah. But, you know, as I, I had a, a conversation with someone else uh, about how the differential FDI per capita are, mm -hmm. right, for the different ASEAN countries. Uh, Singapore is the LeBron James at $19,000 per capita in terms of FDI. Malaysia is the number two guy at 270. Mm -hmm. But Vietnam is, is the guy that's taken lunch from other people nowadays, right? This this culture of collaborating a little bit better is not there yet, seemingly, right? And this this culture of or habit of just unnecessarily competing with each other, as opposed to competing in unison or collectively with respect to the Chinas of the world, the Koreas of the world, or the Europe's of the world. What what would it take for ASEAN's DNA? to get there? Well, I, you know, I've been trying to champion this uh, for years and, and I kind of bruised and battered. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you're the one who wrote the book, man. <laughs> you, can, you can talk a lot about this. You know, I mean, I've been pounding my head about this too, but. And, you know, you, let's, let's take banking, all right? Let's go back to banking. The, the, the qualified banking, um, um, agreement or whatever it's called for ASEAN banks that was issued in 2015 was a joke. You know, they came up with a framework where, you know, it's a multilateral framework, which the, the, the main um, agenda of the multilateral framework was that there will be bilateral negotiations on banking licenses between countries, right? That they spent years working on a document and that's the conclusion. When the reality is that what is important is actually for central banks to enable movement of people, movement of capital, you know, uh, outsourcing of, of operations. 
So why did that happen? Well, because the bureaucrats did it without proper engagement. The private sector is not properly engaged. And when we look at that across uh, multiple sectors, we have that same problem where, you know, there's this huge gap uh, between, you know, the ASEAN bureaucracy and businesses. And I don't think it is unintended. Um, and there's this real uh, kind of feeling that, you know, the, the, the officials know best. Uh, and the private sector should just take it or leave it. And that's a real problem. Why can't we appoint an, a private sector ASEAN Secretary General? I asked that question. Because wow. Because ASEAN is serious about going that's into a game changer. economic integration. Put a private sector guy there who understands business and, and, and really, you know, comes up with proper plans uh, to integrate the economy. Right? And I, I, I'm sure a private sector guy with his first thing would be to engage, um, you know, uh, people with the domain knowledge to come up with the right rules and regulations uh, so that more businesses can be done in front of And how was that received when you suggested that? No. <laughs> the ASEAN way is, you know, the ASEAN way is don't talk about anything too controversial. And, you know, let's talk about but, you know, you've got to respect the fact that whatever it is, I always respect the fact that that organization has done a tremendous job in keeping peace and stability across the region. Right. I must, we must never forget that. But, right. you know, and, but then, you know, you, you cannot therefore mean that you're so sensitive about the discussion on how to make it better and how to improve economic integration. As yeah. you say, the time when you know, the real um, challenge is, you know, businesses are growing in China with a potential market of 1.2 billion people and all the economy scale around it, and then parachuting themselves in ASEAN and having a lunch. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been saying this, that, you know, sooner rather than later, China is not going to be able to produce enough goods and services for itself. And, and ASEAN is just a natural alternative. And, and there is this point of inevitability, right? That we all are, the 10 countries in ASEAN have got to work together to serve as that next, you know, supply chain bastion beyond China. And we can just supply to China, you know, less to the rest of the world. And that's gonna be enough for ASEAN as, as a manufacturing base and all that. So I know it's, it's easier said than done. But I think the more people think about it, talk about it, I think the better chance we have at it. But you know, I mean, you've got to look at, say, you know, in Indonesia, I'm either a, a, a local or a foreign. Yeah. There's nothing in between. Yeah, that's in Malaysia, true. Malaysia is different, you're either local or foreigner. Yeah. So what's all this I said about? Yeah, especially if you talk to the millennials, they don't even identify with ASEAN. You know, it's people are at our age that, that somehow, you know, identify a little bit more with the concept of ASEAN. Yeah. We need to come up with a new name. I, I, I'm also a bit embarrassed to call myself an ASEAN knight. I sound, <laughs> I sound like an alien. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. So, uh, okay, with, uh, I, I, I want to talk about the tech world, you know. What, what's your take on Tesla? Wow. I, I want to just throw you a curveball, you know? The stock has gone crazy, right? And, and, and it's an appreciation for the new thinking, right? Not, not the, 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 the traditional or conventional thinking. And it, it seems to be manifestation of robotics, artificial intelligence, and autonomy, right? And it's priced at a much bigger multiple than any of the, the, the peers. It, it trades at about $5 million per vehicle, whereas Fiat, GM, Ford, they probably trade at about less than $10,000 per vehicle produced. So is, is that an inspiration or is that something that causes more fear to all of us here in Southeast Asia who can't get their act together seemingly? To, 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 to become the next, you know, supply chain bastion? Well, I mean, in the end of the day, um, the, the day of reckoning will come. 
Yeah. Patients have to be, you know, have had we look for reality at some point. And I don't know um, whether my gut feel is kind of overdone today, driven by liquidity and uh, some speculation. Um, but obviously, for as long as uh, it lasts, um, then it's quite terrifying for all of us, right? The kind of equity capital that they can raise is so phenomenal that you know if they use it, they use that currency quickly enough and effectively enough, um, the competition will be wide. Yeah. But it's crazy, you know, how money is actually chasing crazy ideas nowadays. And, and you know, you talked about identity politics and we talked about, you know, the correlation of that with inequality, right? And, and to some extent, inequality is correlated with the lack of education that people are getting, right? To the extent that we're not going to be able to cope or catch up with these new ideas that are coming out from different places, uh, which money is chasing, uh, the farther back we're going to be in chasing money that's needed or capital that's going to be needed for our own collective development. I don't know. What, what, what do you think about that? No, I actually think there needs to be, as I said earlier, there needs to be a global input. Uh, because yeah. we remember this, under this crisis, right, with the QE and the bailing out markets and all that, People with financial assets are okay. Yeah. People who are going to lose a job lost their jobs. People who are going to get a salary cut get their salary cut. And there's a real struggle down there. Uh, whereas up there, actually, people are fine or better. And mm -hmm. unless there is some, you know, macro rethinking and intervention, um, this could, people get to very dangerous, dangerous, dangerous points. And to some extent, they attack on the capital was, was a reflection of this, right? And people better, better stand up and listen quickly. Yeah. Hey, you know, listening to you, it's, it's tough not to be tempted in asking whether or not you want to end up in politics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I... I, I mean, I, you, you come from a political family. Oh. No, I, I, I started off not having politics as an option because my brother um, went into politics and was doing well in politics. Um, in the mid 2010s, around 2015, I got dragged into politics to some extent because um, I was very um, upset uh, at what was happening with um, the one MDP debacle in Malaysia. Um, so I was very... Um, I didn't want to ask you that, but you brought it up. Carry on. <laughs> well, I, was, I, was, I almost went into politics. Uh, and then two ladies uh, dissuaded me. Uh, one was... Your mom. Um, Nairi Woods, who was the dean of the um, School of Government in Oxford. She said, Nazir, look, I completely understand why you want to go into politics, but the very people who are supporting you, encouraging you, will never ever trust you because you stabbed your brother. And he said, you know, Ed Miliband never, even in the West, Ed Miliband never quite recovered from stabbing David, she said. Uh, and then the other lady was Tansi Rapida. I see. Uh, a former I see. trade minister who okay. was campaigning uh, against Najib, but she said, you can't join me. I said, why not? She said, because your mother's, will you know, break your mother's heart. You can't do it. So um, I took that advice and I, you know, uh, I did what I could in terms of voicing my uh, unhappiness, um, but I didn't enter politics. Um, then I spent my time reflecting on the system and I said, actually, there is something political I can do, which is to try and change politics rather than be in politics. So today, you know, if you ask me, I'm not interested in going to politics. What I'm really interested in is changing politics. And I think that can be, you know, a useful contribution, uh, the most useful contribution I can make rather than, you know, running for elections. How do you change politics without well, being is, in politics? Well, this is what I said about my national consultative platform okay. that I want to recruit. Because I think that that is an opportunity yeah. to redefine how we choose our leaders, redefine how our institutions operate. Uh, and that would be a tremendous um, um, new beginning for Malaysia, in, in my view. That's what I want to champion. 
Well, you know, you're still young. <laughs> I mean, we both did. <laughs> I, I don't want to say we're old, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, politics is a function of time, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, all right, man. I, I got to ask you this question, which I forgot to ask you. What, what did you do with that pony that you got from Desawi? <laughs> So uh, I'm sure some very, people would like to, you know, hear about it. Behind it. I was a 10-year-old kid, and I'm, I went to see Des Alwi at that time. was living in, in KL. I had a home in KL. He decided that, you know, I, 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 I needed a, a pony. So he gave me a pony without asking my mom. And, of course, I was quite spot then. I insisted on having it. Um, so I brought the pony back to my house, my mom's house, which was, you know, right in the center of KL. So I had this garden uh, with this huge pony running around. Uh, and I tried my best to play with the pony, but the pony was pretty angry about being in town. Um, so I think the pony almost ran me over. Um, so finally, you know, I, I had to uh, give back this gift uh, uh, to Des, which was very kind of him to, uh, to think about anyway. But that, that was an experience. It, it was getting a little... Too claustrophobic <laughs> in your garden. Hey, any, anything else you want to throw at me, man? Anything else you want to talk about? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But yeah. you know, the the, the 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 main thing I think is the the, the point you made about you know believing in, in regional integration and yeah. how much more people uh, can do together uh, across the region. And we just get kind of, got to get over this hurdle of you know. Um, just you know, all we all must want to be better off, right? If somebody else amongst us is even more better off, so be it. We're still better off, right? And we can do so much more together if we if we collaborate. Which which country in ASEAN? Sorry to keep pounding on this. Which country in ASEAN do you think we ought to take a look at as as a point of reference for? the betterment of ourselves. Some people well, have mentioned Singapore, some people have mentioned Vietnam, some people have mentioned, you know, Indonesia, some people have mentioned Malaysia, if as a Malaysian. Well, no, I look at ASEAN as being um, uh, Indonesia's platform. Okay. It is by far the biggest country. Yeah. It is today trying to take a leadership role. It has the largest economy, it has pretty stable democracy. It has quite strong institution. As in Secretary Sarah is already there. Yeah. But unfortunately, I don't get a sense that Indonesia is very committed to ASEAN. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know the business people there and, 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 and quite a lot of them are kind of saying, hey, you know, if ASEAN means that you can come and uh, uh, compete on my turf, right? Yeah. I'm all, we have the biggest market here. Or you want ASEAN because you can play here, right? that kind of mindset and uh, uh, to get over that mindset um, I think you need um, strong will from the top right yeah. I think the president himself with his political capital needs to step up and uh, uh, champion the ASEAN cause and I to, to be you know with due respect I think he's been a bit ambiguous about ASEAN yeah okay I, I this is the part where I I'm not supposed to say anything about that <laughs> <laughs> I'm only supposed to ask you questions, <laughs> but but it does matter. You know, you ought to you ought to read this book by Marty Natalagawa. I have. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating book. Yeah. You know, it's it's so detailed and it's fascinating. Yeah. To make him ASEAN set gen. If you can't get a business guy, get Marty. Yeah. I'll 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 ping him and I'll tell him that you 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 told me to say that. <laughs> uh, actually we're thinking of inviting him over. I think he would be a good, you know, resource for people to listen to. Hey Jay, thank you so much, man. All right. We've we've, we've spent, pleasure. you know, you know, 80 minutes and, okay. and it's been a good chat. Are you All sure right. there's there's nothing else you want to say? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, you so much. Yeah. Teman-teman, itulah Nazir Azak. Terima kasih.
Inilah Endgame.